So let's now apply this technique of var mapping to a simple non-linear product and this simple non-linear product is let's say a European call or a European put. Before we move ahead let's actually make a qualifying statement beforehand and that is we've taken a look at two camps or two types of approaches which you know all these var mapping approaches can be categorized into and the first approach is what we call analytical or the first type of approaches i should say is analytical and the second type is what we call estimated okay now what is the difference between them analytical set of approaches is one which we resort to if there is let's say a closed form pricing formula available to you which can help you perform this mapping of a, let's say a risky position onto the positions of primitive risk factors so the presence of a closed form pricing formula is what makes this technique analytical if there is no such formula available to you and let's say var mapping has to be done with the help of regressions for example then this technique falls in the camp of estimated so in this world i mean in this or in this use case in which i'm trying to do a var mapping of a product such as a european call because i'm assuming that black scholes model is a decent enough model for example to price these call options i am assuming that i am in this camp of analytical approaches okay so in this camp i am assuming that if i were to focus on a european call option i am assuming that it can be priced using the black scholes model so what the black scholes model helps me do is that it helps me write down the price or fair value of this call option as let's say a function of six inputs these inputs are something which we've dealt with in detail in frm part one it'll be s it'll be k it'll be sigma it'll be r the risk-free rate it'll be r f let's say the risk-free rate in the foreign currency if it's a currency option or you can say it can be the dividend yield the continuous dividend yield if it's a stock option and lastly the time to maturity let's call it tau okay so if i have this kind of a closed form expression available to me then readily speaking i can actually draw from this closed form formula another formula and that formula basically links changes in my final output which is the price of a european call to changes in these inputs so out of these inputs which i have written here let's drop the k because once i have picked up an option k is a static input it doesn't change okay so let's write down that formula i'm trying to explain let's say changes in my final output which is the price of a european call in terms of changes in these guys okay so let's write it down it would be the partial sensitivity of c with respect to s times the change in s the s would have one more term to it and that's the one which introduces non-linearity into this option into this product and that's the gamma so it will be half second derivative of c with respect to s this times ds square plus let's write down the other terms as well it will be sensitivity with respect to sigma times changes in sigma plus sensitivity with respect to r times changes in r sensitivity with respect to q times any change in dividend yield plus sensitivity with respect to time to maturity times the change in time to maturity okay so let's now see what i can do from this formula before i move ahead let's do this let's alongside also write down the black scholes formula so the black scholes formula looks something like this it would be in the presence of dividend yield it would be s times e to the power minus q tau times nd1 minus k e to the power minus r tau times nd2 take a look at both these formulas right and let's draw a certain set of conclusions which we'll then focus on going forward so although i have written down that the change in the value of my position which is let's say in a call european call option can happen because of changes in any of these risk factors right s sigma r q tau 
this doesn't make too much sense for us to actually focus on all these risk factors. Okay, so let's pick the ones which we would want to focus on going forward. The clue for that actually comes from this formula. Take a look at this formula. This formula already tells us what we should do. And that is, it tells us that a position in a call option, remember the aim of war mapping, the aim of war mapping is to decompose a position into a certain set of positions in what we call primitive risk factors. Primitive means it's one layer lower, okay? These primitive risk factors, when it comes to risk measurement and risk mitigation, it would help our case if these primitive risk factors are tradable in nature. We should be able to trade in them, okay? So it will help our case. You know, it's actually, it's not mandatory, but it will help if that, that's the case. Take a look at this expression, right? So this expression on the face of it, what is it telling us? It's telling us that I can pick out two tradables out of this formula. The first tradable is S, okay? If this is a tradable, this can tell me the number of units I am holding of this S, okay? So it's stock price times the number of units. That's the first thing which I can observe. Second thing is, take a look at this guy. What does this guy look to you? This guy is actually a zero coupon bond, right? With a face value K and which is priced as of today by discounting it to today. So that means its face value is K and its current value is the present value of K. That means K e to the power minus R tau. How many units do I hold of this bond? It's these many units, okay? So the Black-Scholes formula is itself telling us what sort of decomposition should be, should we, you know, kind of go ahead with. It's not, it's not as accurate as this because this tells us that the call option price can in fact change not just because of S and R, but also because of sigma and tau, for example, and Q, for example, right? But while if we were to stick with and go ahead with a decomposition, which focuses on two risk factors, this guy and this guy, right? Because the second position, which I have worked out is a zero coupon bond. And the only risk factor which it is sensitive to is the interest rate. That means out of the six, or actually one, two, three, four, five, six, yes. If you were to take S, it's, it's coming in twice. So out of the five in this formula, I have narrowed down to two, just by looking at the Black-Scholes formula, okay? Now, let's do one more thing, okay? And that is, if I were to focus on S, then in this equation, S comes in twice. It comes in first as a delta and then as a gamma, okay? And if I were to, let's say, drop out this guy, drop out this guy and drop out this guy. Let's say only focus on one, two and three. I need to also reason out what to do with two. Okay. So what about two? The second term is to do with gamma. So that part we know, right? So the second term itself also can be actually dropped if we consider positions whose gamma is very low. That means whose delta doesn't change by that much, okay? So to get to that position, go back to FRM part one. FRM part one basically taught us that gamma tends to be high for at the money options, which are short dated in nature. Let's say an option which is expiring in a week's time, for example. So if we focus on, let's say long dated options for which tau is very high, then the gamma for these options would be, would be kind of low and we can ignore the second term. That means the only two terms that we'll be left with in our VAR mapping would be the first term, which is to do with S, and second term, which will be to do with R, okay? So that's, that's my reasoning to actually arrive at only two positions. Now let's focus on these two positions. So what I'm saying right now is, let's take the value of my position, which is CBS, and let's assume it can be mapped on to these many units of the underlying stock and these many units 
of a zero coupon bond okay of face value k that's what the black scholes model is telling me let's take a look at the signs it's telling me this term is a plus this term is a minus that means this term would amount to a long position in the underlying stock these many units of it and this negative sign tells us it will be a short position in let's say a dollar bill these many units of each of face value k okay so that's what we stand at right now so let's take an example now the example is i'll give you two options these are from the reading let's say these options are on a stock which is currently trading at hundred dollars the time to maturity of this option is three months this set of two options i mean the interest rate is five percent there is no dividend yield and the volatility of this stock is 20 percent okay let's take a look at two options let's take a look at first and add the money option and second slightly out of the money option okay so the value of this first option is let's <clears throat> let's note down the value it's 4.2 the value of the second option is 1.04 dollars both come from black scholes the delta of this first option delta call is close to 0.5 it's 0.536 because it's an add the money option the delta of the second option is 0.195 okay so let's say this is the data which is given to us so what does it tell us about the var mapping it tells us that i can map this first option into two positions the first position would be 0.536 units of the stock this is my first term here and that means i have mapped it to 53.6 dollars worth of the underlying because the underlying right now trades at 100 okay the second position which i can map it to is a short position in a dollar bill and i can arrive at the value of that short position simply by doing this i can write down my call option premium as delta times s minus this short position or i should say plus this short position the minus gets accommodated in the short position so mine this so that means my short position is actually equal to c minus delta s okay so that means it would be 4.2 minus 0.536 into 100 that means it is equal to minus 49.40 let's read it out verbally it means that this first call option i can actually decompose it into two positions it would be a long position in 53.6 dollars worth of the underlying stock coupled with a short position in a dollar bill which is 49.40 dollars in size or you can say it's a long position in 53.6 dollars worth of the stock which has been financed using 49.40 worth of risk-free borrowing okay so let's write it down as minus here similarly i can do the same exercise for my second option it would mean that i can decompose it into a 19.5 dollars worth of the underlying position coupled with it will be 1.04 minus 19.5 which means which means coupled with minus 18.46 dollars worth of the borrowing okay so this stock position has been financed using this much of borrowing so where does this mapping helps help us with first comes first let's do an aggregation that means if the two options really did have the same time to maturity this borrowing and this borrowing is actually the same okay so these two borrowings are both at the same rate which is r and for the same maturity which is three months i can aggregate them okay so net net the two options they aggregate to a total position of 73.1 dollars worth of the stock as well as a short dollar bill which is the total of these two which is 67.86 okay so that's the aggregate position that's where the benefit of mapping comes in it helps you aggregate positions after you have converted or mapped each 
position into its primitive risk factors. By the way, this aggregation of the dollar bill wouldn't have been possible if these two positions were in different, <coughs> I mean, call options with different maturities. You could still have aggregated the stock positions, but you shouldn't have aggregated then the two dollar bills together. I could have done it right now because they two are the same maturity. Now, where does it help us in terms of risk estimation? If I was doing the risk estimation, I mean the VAR estimation of these two positions, I mean the two call options, I would have to do them separately. Okay. But now what I can do is now since I have aggregated the two together into a single position, right? And if I assume that the dollar bill doesn't have too much of risk associated with it. Why? Because let's say the volatility of changes in interest rates is tiny when it comes to or compares to the volatility of changes in stock prices. Okay. That means I only have a single mapping position and that is $73.1 worth of the underlying stock. Very quickly, I can compute my VAR using delta normal VAR. It will be 73.1. That's the total size of my position. That times Z at the corresponding confidence level and that times the sigma okay so var mapping it would help us both in terms of getting to the aggregate position which can now be stressed for example or getting to the aggregate var numbers for my portfolio let's say if this option portfolio is on the same stock okay because that's when i can aggregate it so therefore, what we've covered in this video is how to do VAR mapping of option positions and where all this mapping can come and help us.